The people who are recording. Come and record. Fine. Did you, does anyone ever come to you and give you a last question? Yeah, I have it. Okay. So I'm going to try today to first, before we launch into a discussion, which loses a lot of people, I gather, and intimidates them, uh, lay out maybe for half an hour what I think this very hard and confusing chapter is all about. It's a real challenge. I don't claim to have succeeded, but I've made a try. Okay, so here, so the, the basic point of the chapter is, I think, that normal people have this basically interconnected form of experience in which there's always something that they're dealing with or thinking about, but always on a horizon or a background of a lot of other stuff that they are not dealing with or thinking about, but is somehow available to them and it, you, they can develop these uh, horizons in any all sorts of directions. So I've made a list of some. I'm sure there are more, but here's five. Normal people have well, all these kinds of interconnected experience. They know where the parts of their body are and how to get to them, like swatting a mosquito or whatever, blowing their nose. I'll tell you which of these Schneider has and which he doesn't have and why in a minute. Uh, how then, too, they know how things are grasped with one sense or one organ, one hand. I don't know, is there a word that covers hands? Uh, and feet or people, you don't grasp with your hands. Anyway, they have a sense of how things are grasped and uh, with one organ or one member of the body or also with one sense uh, organ and another so they can see how something would sound and so we'll talk a lot more about that pretty soon but already we understand that they can, that an organist for instance can uh, sit down at an organ in an hour get a sense of how it's all functions in a way that he can grasp it, even, even though the keys are in different places and the uh, registers are different and so forth. People have that intersensorial transposability um, and intergraspable transposability. And they also have a sense of where things that they normally deal with are, where things that they normally deal with are and how to get to them. That's important because that extends our body space to new things like the blind man taking up a cane or the musician taking up the organ or any other instrument and so forth. But beyond that, it extends it to our, our body space extends to all the sorts of things that we know how to get to so that our finding a way around in the city gets taken over and inhabited by our body space and our finding a way, our way around in a house and on the campus and so forth. <coughs> All of these things that we normally deal with become extensions of body space and we can extend it to new places and new things as we acquire new skills. Um, and then in a way that I didn't work out so much and which he throws in every once in a while we have the same thing on the level of thoughts. We, uh, we understand how our ideas are connected, how stories are connected, how conversations are connected, in a way in which wherever you are in the story, you know what led up to it and what's coming after it, roughly. Where you are in a conversation, you're able to know, remember where you came from and where you're going. And remember isn't even the right word. The conversation just feels like it's already bringing with it the past meaning as part of what a as part of the current meaning of what's being talked about and is setting up a future meaning which isn't something you have to think about and project any more than you have to think about the back of the house as a future experience when you're looking at the front. Keep that in mind always. The back of the house is already on the horizon of the front. It's, the front looks like it looks the way it does because it has the back. And the conversation is going the way it is because it came from someplace and it's going someplace. So that's number four. Number five, very abstractly too, we have the notion of numbers and that they are functionally related in, in terms of their meaning. So you get this funny example about plus and minus five. Five plus four minus five. Uh, Schneider has to figure out that that is four. 
whereas we just look at it and think, well, the fives cancel out. He adds it up and gets nine, and then he gets subtracts five. Ah, uh, what do you know? It's four. Uh, I'm um, in, interested in that because in, in the days when I thought about computers and artificial intelligence, there was a logic program that was considered very good and was considered by people like Newell and Simon, who was thinking that they were doing some kind of cognitive psychology, to be thinking like we think. And I looked at it and I discovered that what it had was things like that. It would, say, it would do logic sort of, of, of this and then that too, and then it takes that right back again um, in some way, and then it has to figure all that out. It can't just see that, I don't know, greater than and less than cancel each other out. I forget the example. It was even simpler than that. It was, see if I can remember, this or... I don't know. Now, if I go back and look at my notes, and very simple logical functions, just like adding five and subtracting five, the, the computer had to go through the steps, even though you could see immediately that one of these things canceled out the other. So, but we don't have to see it that way. And now that, those are the five. And we all get better and better at doing this sort of thing by acquiring new bodily and mental skills that extend the range of our ability to think and our ability to get around. By the way, I have to say it someplace, and I feel so strongly about it, that I better say it now before I forget. When I say skills, you don't find the word skill in here, ever. You find, and it's not the translator's fault, exactly. The French don't seem to have a good word for skill. So maybe Olivia can help us. The word is what habilité, I think, that gets translated habit here. Habit's the wrong word. Habit's the absolutely. That may be what it means in French, but it can't be what Merleau-Ponty means. I mean, we say so, habits are rigid, sort of meaningless, context-independent something or other. It's like flipping the light switch when you go in the room, whether the, you know the electricity has failed or not. And the, his example of a habit on 165, which is the first place I found where the w word comes in, is forming the habit of dancing. Well, think about that. Dancing isn't a habit. You may have the habit of going dancing at 6 o'clock every Saturday or something, a routine and boring habit. The dancing is a skill. Uh, it's not like brushing your teeth, which even that is may be a skill. For, and, but, and it's crucial to everything that Ponty says. He never means habit. He always means skill. Now, I, and if you understand, Olivia, what happened in, in French or in English or in the translation that made this peculiar, bad move. I think it's, it's partly because of his reference to Bergson. I was going to say, it, the one place where, where he really means habit is a footnote to Bergson. It's funny you should mention that, but how could that ruin the whole chapter? And here he is at the bottom of 165. <laughs> I see, for Bergson too. Well, but in, in the footnote on 165, he says, as Bergson, for example, thinks when he defines habit as the fossilized residue of a spiritual activity. Now, that is a habit. That's the light switch thing. You once knew what it meant, but now you ju your arm just goes up in a meaningless way. The body is itself the concrete phase of existence as well. Uh, it is, okay. But when he's talking about acquiring new something or others, he's not acquiring new fossilized residues of spiritual activity. You, you say yourself to acquire something new, so you, yeah. you can count on it, so it's always present yeah. to you, and this is thanks to the body. Yes, all that. Right. That's what skills are. You acquire a new skill, it's present, you can call on it any time, but it's adaptable and you can improve it and uh, yeah, so forth. It doesn't mean that you can improve it, I think. It's just, it's just okay. whatever Well, I think, I, I mean, I, all, all I understand talking to you is that habit just doesn't mean the same thing to somebody in French as it does to, to me. I don't know whether there's something wrong with me or not. Habit has got to be, for us, sort of routine, meaningless kind of activity. We've got a word for what you can acquire, what gets sedimented in the body, what you can make richer and richer. That's skill. 
Now, I suspect the French must have one word for this. Yeah. Could you give an example of a habit in the bad sense? I did with my life switch story, but let me give you another. Uh, you could have the habit of dancing to talk like him, but that wouldn't be. I mean, make no sense. Try to explain to somebody who's taken up ballroom dancing that they've now acquired the habit of dancing. That's ridiculous. They've acquired the skill. What the habit would be, just to give you an example, is you get boringly into the routine of going dancing every Saturday at 9. That's a habit. That, and you can acquire that too, but it's different. So, uh, so, so a better example of that has nothing to do with skills is, you know, I have the habit of reading for low fine teeth before going to sleep. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's right. not a skill. That's not a skill. Nobody could say that that's a okay. skill. And, and it, it, if you don't see the distinction between habit and skill, all of this stuff toward the end, from where, that where he talks about the habit of dancing, and then he talks about the habit of you, the blind man using the stick, and so forth and so forth, that's always skills. These are motor habits he talks about at, the, at 175. Those are motor skills um, everywhere. I'm sorry, but on page 177 in the French, yeah? Probably around 176 in your edition. That's where we. This is where I'm reading. This very minute. Yeah. Okay. Every habit is at the same time motor and perceptual because it resides, as we say, between the explicit perception and the effective movement and the fundamental perception. That. Uh, yes, that's right. Every, but that's not a habit. That's a skill. The habit of going dancing on Saturday night doesn't reside between perception and motion. But, that, but the skill of dancing just resides between perception and motion. Sure, habits all over these places. It's all, he says he's been analyzing motor habits. And he says, and then he goes into the blind man and his stick. The blind man might have a habit, just I keep repeating myself, but it's so important. You just won't get it if you don't understand. That this doesn't mean habit. The blind man doesn't acquire the habit of using his stick when he goes out in the sense of a routine thing that he would use it no matter what. He acquires a skill of using his stick, meaning that he uses it to feel the world at the end of it, and perception and action are tied together. Why do you resist this? I don't understand. What, we've got a good word for this. It's called skill. In English. And you mean why you have a use this word? Well, yeah, that I think is a question about the French. What's the word in French? Abitude. Abitude. Oh, well, yes. that's even worse. That's why I was thinking about that. Actually, it means skill. It's in French. No, but now what he aims at is skill. Yes, it means skill, and our translator should have said skill, because habit means something else. And habitude in French, when I hear it, is more close to this routine, yeah, boring the, thing. In, in the sense of Darkson, it's closer to the skill sense. Is it? Okay, well, however, it's so important that you should really go through in the book, and I hope you're doing this, because it makes a big difference to your understanding if the words go against your intuitions at every turn. You should have written body schema everywhere where it says body in it. But you could file sort of get away without that, I think, after a while. But you just can't get away without canceling every time he talks about habit and putting in skill, or you just won't have any kind of intuition at all of what he's talking about. Did you notice the funny place? I, it might be interesting to look at in the French. But one place, all of a sudden, the translator, as if he woke up, translates body schema by body schema. I don't know what to make of that. Then he goes right back to image again. I don't know if he had a lot of coffee or something. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of 164, the acquisition of a habit, that's already wrong, the acquisition of a skill, that sentence demonstrates everything, as a rearrangement and renewal of the corporal schema. That's amazing. Presents great difficulties to traditional philosophers, and so forth. Okay, that, that's, yeah. I know I'm not saying That's that. right, but I, I might ignore it. You can say it anyway. Well, just a, just a yeah. conceptual point. In English, skill is also sort of conceptually connected to the idea of disposition. Good. And disposition is another word for habit. Yeah. So there is a semantic field here where what is a habit and what is a skill are overlapping. So there's okay. a, it's not an entirely, it's not a mistranslation. It's, it's, a, it's a distinctive use of a... Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to discuss it, but I'll say one thing. I think the fact that the disposition is overlaps both of them in some way doesn't convince me that habit and skill overlap at all. I think they are totally separate semantics. You'll, we'll talk later. I, but I'm just challenged. Think of an example of where something can, where 
you can't tell whether we're talking about a habit or a skill. I think in each case, speaking as a skill. I mean, do I have the habit of speaking? I might have the habit of speaking, and, you know, every time uh, of the, I don't know, when the parrot comes into the room, I say something to it. But or the, the parrot may have a habit of speaking. Your linguistic practices are not habitual. I don't think. I don't. It's up to you to what you think about it. Uh, I mean, my sense of that is my linguistic practices are a skill I've acquired. But anyway, it, don't worry about it. If there is some area where they may overlap, there's huge areas where they don't. And Merleau-Ponty is writing about areas where they don't. He's talking about motor skills you can acquire, like using a stick, like dancing, like uh, finding your way around in your house, like whatever. Uh, okay, that's, that, I had to put that aside in somewhere, because I think it's really important not to get confused by the translation. Okay, now let's see. So we can get better and better at acquiring new bodily and mentally sk mental skills. That's what I said so far. Now, just to, in your list, Schneider can do the first three. He can know what his body is when he swats a mosquito. He can know what he can grasp something with one hand or the other. Um, he can. Uh, he he knows where things normally are and how to get to them, like his own house. Uh, what he can't do is uh, take it over new situations. That he can't uh, enrich his world by learning new habits so that new things show up for him as something he can find and do. This is a 155. Um, there is it. Uh, at the bottom. Just as he, about eight lines from the bottom, just as he needs by means of preparatory movements to be able to take a grip on his own body before performing movement, before performing movements when they are not mapped out ahead in a familiar situation. So, just as he means well. I thought it said somewhere that he couldn't acquire new habits, but I don't think I've marked it right. Um, I think he can. Maybe if he's finished that sentence, let me try. Just as he needs by means of preparatory movements to be able to take a grip on his own body before performing movements well, oh, when they're not mapped out in a familiar situation, yeah. I mean, whenever he's in a new situation, this is only half of what I wanted the sentence to say, but when he's in a new situation, we can just already convert into doing something that we haven't done before. Uh, uh, we can find our way to a new house, for instance, go right off. He can't do that. He has to turn it all into completely kind of computer-like, uh, mental... Uh, uh, rule before he can learn it, and he never turns it. It never turns into a habit, I think. But it doesn't say that. I mean, I think he's stuck with the familiar situations he's got. New situations don't become familiar to him. But I'm not sure, and nothing depends on that. So I, I just thought it was that way. I'll write a question mark here. If anybody finds evidence how this is, let me know. Uh, okay, now. But the important thing is that he can do the first three, uh, but uh, he can't do the last ones, it seems. That is, he can't uh, uh, understand numbers. We said that as an example. He can't understand stories. He can't understand conversations. He can't understand metaphors and so forth. Uh, those are all, those aren't body things. Those are not sensory motor things. And where, and though he's got this sort of diminished sensory motor world, he's got, he's got an even more diminished sort of intellectual world where he's just like a computer. He can only do these things calculated together, meaningless squiggles. He, he knows what to do with the squiggle 5 and the squiggle 4 and the squiggle 5 and plus and minus. And he knows that when you do those things, well, lo and behold, it comes out 4. Uh, but he doesn't know why or what that means or how to adapted to other situations. Okay, that's basic point of chapter. That was the first thing. Uh, okay, we, we do the above things and can incorporate new meanings and new situations because we can see the meaning or significance of our movements and of our ideas. Now, there's some way in which he lacks seeing the meaning or the significance of his movements and his thoughts. Now, the more important thing is to skip him for a while and now follow out what Merleau-Ponty thinks we can do. 
So our actions and our ideas call up other actions and ideas. That's this horizon story. I'm going to give you a bunch of pages where he's saying this because I think it's important. Um, on 151, bottom, whereas in the patient the meaning has to be brought in from elsewhere by an act of interpretation. Conversely, in the normal person, the subject's intentions are immediately reflected in the perceptual field, polarizing it, and so forth and so forth. A wave of significance, effort, effortlessly setting up uh, a wave of significance, and so forth. The, in the patient, the perceptual field has lost this plasticity. That's lost its horizons, presumably. And he says that lots of times. The bottom of one... 52, the translation of percept into movement is affected by, by the expressed means of language. That's neither. He has to think it out. Whereas the normal subject penetrates into the object by perception, assimilating its structure into his substance, and through his body the object directly regulates his movements. Now the blind man's cane is a good extreme example of that, where you penetrate into the object and so forth. But anything will do when you get to understand your coffee cup, then you've got, then you've got that one of these kinds of grips on it, and the coffee cup can regulate your movements. That is, when you get ready to have coffee, the coffee cup will solicit your hand to go in the right place, in the right shape, and if the handle happens to be hidden behind, it doesn't matter, but you know, your body knows the handle is there, and just where it is, and goes there. But not magically, in the sense that you knew that before you ever, uh, encountered your coffee cup, but magically in Merleau-Ponty sense, and you don't have to think that it's your coffee cup and it has a handle and the handle is on the back, and when all that interpretation and thinking is done, then you can just, then you reach for it. It's magically uh, in the sense that in your world, once you've acquired the skill of drinking from your coffee cup, it all just happens automatically, spontaneously. Maybe automatic is to have it. Uh, routine life. It happens spontaneously. It could become automatic, but then it would, never mind, it would have to be real rigid and you would have to have the cup, I think I shouldn't try to do this, it'll just we'll sink back into a previous discussion I don't want to go into. So 165, just, just collecting the quotes that are important. Here's the blind man's stick at the bottom. It's not an object for him and its, its point becomes the area sensitive to and the scope and radius and so forth are all just taken up in his, in his activity. They've gone, as Merleau-Ponty sometimes says, I couldn't find it, they, they, go on, they get on the side of the object. Sorry, they are on the side of the subject. Maybe he, that's a bad way of talking. Maybe he doesn't say it. Maybe I just said it. Because I don't want to call us a subject for him. They are taken over by the body, that's what he says, and become part of the body space uh, and become our access to the world if it's obtained, or just become the layout of the world that we inhabit, to use his terms, when we get around in a, learn to get around in a city and so forth. So on 166, he's talking about, he's still talking, trying to get you to see that this isn't any mental activity. There's no quick comparison, he says, I like this on 166, between the object's length and the stick. And so the, the, the blind man doesn't have to do that, doesn't in, in Merleau-Ponty kind of talk, have to pass through the objective world, doesn't have to know where the object is in the objective world, where the stick is in the objective world, and what the stick therefore tells him about the object. That is all gone. He did have to start there. Again, it's not magical. He doesn't know, the blind man doesn't automatically have the stick, but he has to get it. And when he gets it, then he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to think about it consciously. He doesn't have to think about it unconsciously. He doesn't even have to process it in, in a certain sense. I mean, according to Merleau Ponty, and it's really important, the blind man does not have a bunch of, well, when the blind man starts with the stick, he has these something or others in the palm of his hand or bumps as he bumps along. And he interprets, that's remember the word interprets. This is what he does when he hasn't got the skill. He interprets the bumps in the palm of his hand as meaning there's a curve there. That's what it is not to inhabit the stick, not to bring it into your body, not to make it part of the horizons of your uh, uh, coping uh, world. 
But after a while, and this is the crucial thing, the bumps go away. Now, it's very important how you understand that. If you think the bumps are still there in the palm of your hand and you feel them, but, and you interpret them, but it's all unconscious now and very fast, then you are getting it wrong, according to Melo uh, The main Anybody know Polanyi anymore? The person who gets this sort of brilliantly wrong is Michael Polanyi in his book, The Tacit Dimension. He does the Cain story, and he says that at first you have to focus on the bumps in the palm of your hand, but later, instead of being distal, that is, the object of your attention, they become proximal. They become so close to you that you don't really notice them anymore. But I notice how I'm putting that. They're still there. You're still getting the, not just the information about the pain, uh, the pain in the palm of your hand, because you have to get that information. But it's not coming to you perceptually anymore. It's being processed outside of your mind altogether, according to the phenomenology of it, according to Merleau-Ponty. We'll come back to this later. But the important thing he wants to stress is you are not interpreting, you do not have a rule, he says this too, that relates the bumps in the palm of your hand to where the stick is. When you've got the habit on the side of the body, the phenomena is that the stick has become part of you, it's transparent, you don't feel anything in the palm of your hand, what you feel when you use the stick is the curve. He says that explicitly. Um, and, uh, but in fact, I better turn to it. Um, It goes on about this a long time. Here we are on page 176, um, about 20 lines down. Well, no, we'll start with eight lines down. It would appear in this case that the perception is always a reading off of the sensory data, that is, the twitches in the palm of the hand, but constantly accelerating, operating ever with ever more attenuated signals. That is sort of dimly and out of consciousness. But habit does not consist in interpreting the pressures of the stick on the hand as an indication of certain <laughs> habit again, skill of course, the skill of using the stick does not consist in interpreting the pressures of the stick on the, on the hand as indications of certain positions of the stick and these are signs of external objects since it relieves us of the necessity of doing so. Now, you can still say, ah, but it's all going on unconsciously. Uh, all I think Merleau Ponty would say in response to that is, well, the burden of proof is on you to say that. The phenomenology is that the stick is now just a part of my body. And I don't have to, just as I don't have to understand the pressure on, the pa on, the, on my feet to know how the floor is going, I don't have to understand the pressure on my hand to know how the curve is going. So let's go on with that. Um, the pressures on the hand and the stick are no longer given. That's the crucial line. They are no longer perceived. The stick is no longer an object perceived by the blind man, but an instrument with which he perceives. It's a bodily auxiliary and so forth. But, and, I don't know how much do I have to read. The external object is not the geometrized projection of an invariant of a set of perspectives, but something towards which the stick leads us. The perspectives of which, according to perceptual experience, are not signs, but aspects. That's another way to put it. Signs are what you have to interpret. They're the perceptual given, which supposedly, and I think, well, which correctly, it, he says, you have to interpret when you start to learn the stick. But they stop being signs, and you stop interpreting them when you get it to the stick. Again, so they're not, it's, uh, now, now, what's, what's the wrong view then? It's called intellectualism, of course. And, it, and intellectualism takes the world up, takes up these elements of impression and then interprets them by somehow, well, it could be that you did it by association, but that's such a loser view that it's dropped out by now. That we don't even hear about the empiricist anymore. But we still hear about the, the, the guy who thinks that there is an interpretation, a cognitive intention, in which the sensory data are grasped and, so, and put together by an intelligible core. You see that? The usual word for that is concept. Uh, for for uh, Husserl, who has this wrong view, according to Nero Fanti, the word is no even. And the idea is that you've got some kind of rule in your mind or law which enables you to put these things together. Um, let's go on. Uh, so it's a, a reference to Husserl where he says they're, they're taken up and put together by an intelligible core. 
At this point, he's admitting that at least this stage of Husserl, he's in so Husserl is an intellectualist. But this analysis distorts the sign and the meaning because it separates out by a, pro by a process of objectification. That's the prejudice du monde. That's the prejudice of the world. It has turned the stuff in the palm of your hand into objects, which you have to relate to the curve out there with it, which is an object. So it's done in the, the sensations which were pregnant with meaning and the invariable core is not a law but a thing. What is that? The, the, the sense content which is already pregnant with meaning and the invariant core is not a law but help. Man, what kind of sentence is this? But this analysis distorts both the sign and the meaning. We got that. That sign being the twitches misunderstood and the uh, meaning being some intellectual thing you bring to it, which is a misunderstanding. It separates out by a process of objectification of both the sense content, and it, which is already pregnant with meaning, Merleau-Ponty says, but not the world prejudice, and the invariant core, which is not a law, but a thing. Ah, of course. The law would be the rule, the, the concept for putting it all together. But that there is no such invariant core. There's just the the... The, the curve or whatever it is that you, you're feeling at this point. It can feel the arcanic relationship between subject and world, the act of transcendent consciousness, the momentum which carries it into the thing, into a world, by means of its organs. Okay. Yeah. That, so that's the first thing I want to say about horizons. Now, uh, yeah. That should be a troubling sentence. No, not at all. Which, which one? Isn't Lola Ponty using the phrase active transcendence of consciousness? Ah, ah between, well, yes, I don't like that. You're right. Between subject and world, I didn't like. Subject, I don't think is the right thing to say. Transcendent consciousness, I don't like. You're right. That troubles me, too. I don't know why he wants to say that at okay, this point. He has to use that as evidence. Yeah, that's right. He shouldn't say that. I, it, it troubles me. Except that the, the, uh, I've got sort of like... 30 lines on my side, and you've got one line on your side. Uh, that otherwise, it's a problem. The other line should, 30 lines should help trouble you, but we'll have to talk about that. Okay, where are we? 176, uh, let's see, I, I just call up other actions and ideas. Is that where I am? I don't know where I got off to this. Uh, Yeah, okay, I did 171, and then I did 165. Yeah, there's a blind man and stick, and 166, and 167. Uh, yeah, okay. So Merleau-Ponty calls the movement side of this flexible adaptability where you stop having signs and interpreting them and just become open to the world. That's motility. That's what the chapter's about. Uh, but he uses the word motility not all that much, so I thought I would point out, having said what goes on, well, that he calls it motility, motility. The bottom of 158. These elucidations enable us to clearly understand motility as the basic intentionality. Consciousness, aha, this is going to make Alva happy, but because it makes me unhappy. You can see that. Consciousness at the top of 159. Consciousness is in the first place not a matter of I think, but I can. Disaster. He never should say that. That's a Husserl phrase. He can't mean that because on 167 or 161, 161, he's talking about what he should say, at the, at the starting on 160. A movement is learned when the body is understood, it, that is, when it is incorporated into its world, to move one's body is to aim at things through it. That sounds like an I can. But, goes on, it is to allow oneself to respond to their call. That's the right thing to say. That's the gestalt thing. That it isn't an I can do, it's that it draws me to do. And it isn't drawing me in the sense of an I. It's drawing the corporal schema, the one in me. Remember, one experiences things. There is a, in, in Heidegger talk, das man, side of the, the body. It's, it's one who perceives in me, not I. And what it does is not put a meaning on things, but be open to the call of things. And, uh, I was just thinking, oh yeah, I, I put on reserve a, a book called Ways of the Hand, 
by uh, David Sudnow learning to be a jazz musician, and by the end of the book, I mentioned it, but I put it on reserve, he's very clear, thanks to me, I must say, because I had the manuscript that he talked like Husserl. He said, by the end of the book, my, I, I know jazz, and I reach for the right notes. And I said, what? <laughs> You're calling this book Ways of the Hand. Why do you think that? So you'll see that the end of the book is rewritten in which he says, my hand knows jazz and reaches for the right notes. That's the right thing to say. Now his hand is, in fact, he should say, I don't remember how far I beat him into this, drawn to the right notes. Uh, and it, it, that's very important. If, and it's, it's just a... I mean, this is this funny relation he has to Husserl. I mean, just when he shouldn't be taking up Husserl, he does for a minute. Yeah. Well, it seems like <coughs> he could keep the phrase I can so yeah. long as the I means body schema and not uh, transcendentally. Well, and the can should, should be, as long as we're clear that that's, an, uh, oh, oh, I can respond, or that's I can be called. Body schema is. Yeah, right? is this, okay. This, this, uh, this positional right, skills. that's right. He can keep it as long as he changes the, the meaning it has for, for, I think, for Husserl, at least the meaning it has in ordinary English, to say I can is much too individual and much too active. Well, you want it to be at least equally impersonal and passive, you know, when you have a skill. You, you, you must be getting used to that now, that you are drawn in by the affordances. That's what he agrees with the Gestaltists about. When, do you remember the arms of the heroes going out to the food in front of them? Uh, Achilles doesn't say, I can reach for the, the, the grapes. Achilles' arm just goes out and reaches for the grapes when Achilles is hungry. That's better. That's, he, he responds to the call of the food in front of him. Yeah. Uh, you might conduct by the fact that one could think that when, I, when you say I can, you need a representation first. But this isn't implied that the I can. Is it implied that there's an individual I as opposed to one can? See, I want him to say one can. And when he does say the body is, it's one that perceives in me. It's, I don't think he should say I can. Uh, and, and I, of course, Husserl does, because he thinks the transcendental ego does it, and that's an I. Although Husserl once was smart enough to see there was no ego, he, he brought it in later. But at the same time, there are only said that the body is the subject of the perception. Yeah, he couldn't. I mean, I agree, that's what he says sometimes, and sometimes he's very clear. It, well, yeah, but then, the, the how, what he really means, and I, that is, I think we both agree, there is something like a body subject. The body subject is me as an embodied moving organism in the world. As long as you understand that, you're okay. But when Descartes used subject, he thought of it as something separable from the world. Yeah, but from Husserl doesn't, when he says I can, he meets uh, an embodied subject as well. Well, I hope so, but Husserl too? Yeah. Hmm. There, there's no transcendental subject in there doing this. It could have done it even if there was no world. This is what Husserl says at that stage. You need the body to say, I can. Yeah, but is that the last, so to speak, in the last analysis? But let's not talk about it now. I mean, I didn't, I didn't tell his death, Husserl thought that in the last analysis it was done by a transcendental subject. I think, I think Taylor Carman's paper sheds light on this topic, and I think there Carmen interprets Husserl as, as having this understanding of the self as being a peculiar totality that sticks together these subject object qualities and that's why it fails. So even though even though I think Olivia is right in that Husserl says that there is this kind of unity, this unity is really just a hodgepodge for itself and itself meshed together. Which okay, well let's read read uh, read Taylor Carmen and see what you think. <coughs> but let me go back to this. I promised I wouldn't go into discussions and I can't resist. So so why did I do this? Because the I can came up and triggered my anti-Husserl reaction. Uh, so where were we? Where's the I can? Top of 159. I must have just read 159. Yeah. I, okay. But again, if you if you're sort of warned how to hear it, you're all right. I'm at the top of 161 now, where you're responding to the call. Because it's all about what I said I would read you where he tells you what motility is. Motility, then, is not as it were a handmaiden of consciousness, transporting the body to a point in space in which we formed a representation beforehand. In order, that we may, in, in order that we may be able to move our body towards an object, the object must first of all exist for it. Our body must not belong to the realm of the in itself, and so forth. And then skipping to the next paragraph, the body inhabits space 
in time. And that's just the same point he's, he's making so over and over. So how do we do this? That's the next question. How do we inhabit space and time with the body? And the answer is, and I'm setting things up, by the way, if you don't think this is really an answer, don't be upset. I don't think it's really an answer either. Is this, uh, but, uh, his answer seems to be, well, we do it because we have horizons. In a way, that is an answer. Phenomenologically, he's going to give you the basic phenomena in terms of this particular kind of phenomena that he's been describing, of inhabiting the world, inhabiting the body, taking up the cane, uh, being able to do arithmetic. All of those are examples of the kind of things we can do because, remember, I said there's always a lot on the horizon of what we're doing. Um, now, I just want to show you places where he says that. 149 is a place where he says that a lot. And it, it helps, I see, because there's two different meanings of subject here. I mean, the body is the subject. I don't like it. But, if, but anyway, if, if he's not a Kantian subject halfway down. The Kantian subject posits a world. But in order to be able to assert a truth, the, act, the, truth, the actual subject must in the first place have a world and be in the world. That is, sustain around about it a system of meanings whose reciprocities, relationships, and involvements do not require to be made explicit in order to be exploited. That's a very important sentence. One, it's telling you what the body schema is and does. Two, it's telling you that you, uh, it's done it on the level of these meanings that are just interrelated. And I think it's important, though I can't tell you fully why I think yet it's important. These involvements, the way the system of meanings, which is the body schema works, do not require it to be made explicit in order to be exploited. Surely that's right. I think he thinks, and I'm going to come back to that, they don't even have to be implicit to be exploited. To be implicit is a very, very bad intellectualist move, which is always to say, well, if you're not conscious of it, it's the same sort of thing and you could be conscious of it. I want to stress, and I'll come back to it again and again, that it's very important that Primero Conti, this thing which he sometimes calls a synergistic system, the way all the parts of the body and all the parts of my familiar world are interrelated, is not something that you could make explicit. It's not that, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of interrelatedness which is what is sort of sui generis to the lived body. And whenever you see implicit, you should reach for your pistol as far as I can see. Uh, the latest one is Bob Brandon in his book, Making It Explicit. But it, it's already, as Brandon is proud to say, in Hegel. The, it, the intellectualist always claims that what they have finally been able to understand mentally must have been there all along going on and that they are just bringing it out and they what's happening oh now something is parade is about to go by now what are they denouncing or or defending <laughs> it's not very clear does anybody know what that means <laughs> Uh, it's very bad to have a parade uh, all together either advanced. denouncing or defending something that nobody knows what it means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people went to a lot of trouble to tell us something. They want to more of minorities? How can you tell? Because that's what I am though. Six-year-olds are underrepresented. <laughs> <laughs> How long is this going to go on? Quite a long time. Okay, I've got to go on talking. Time is short. <laughs> Close those windows, please. Um, where are we? What? I can't even hear. Is that what it says? Well, whatever it says, it's not what we're doing, so we better go on. Um, these acquired worlds, what am I, I'm looking at 149 now. But I, remember I said the, one, the, the horizons are not implicit, and they, they're certainly not explicit, 
They, and they're not implicit either. I'll come back to that. I think that's the most important thing to, to, to say, because as soon as you use the word implicit, you, unless you want to be an intellectualist, you will find yourself an intellectualist. Because implicit says always, it could, have been, it could be thought. And, and I think that the, the, the corporal schema can't be thought. Okay, so that's a pretty strong claim. I mean, that's the claim that you couldn't ever become aware of the way in which, you know, your body is... That's right. The, 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 the total in, is intersensorial way that everything sort of uh, refers to everything else in some amazingly systematic way, I think he thinks you cannot become aware of it. But I'm, I, I'm again, no talking. You, 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 okay, one remark. <laughs> this is always hopeless, right? Let's just talk about analogies. Um, Schneider needs to make the analogies explicit in order to understand them. Great. You're, you're a wonderful straight person. Yeah, that's to show that that's not what we do. That's, the, that's why he talks about it. We don't do that. We do not have to make analogies explicit <laughs> when we understand them. But again, they just express this intersensorial unity that just we can just see that the, the thing down there is the foot of the table. Right, but we're still capable of it. Ah, well, Schneider does it good. And we can, we can spell out the analogy sometimes. <laughs> it's such a wonderful analogy John Searle's written a whole article about. I'm thinking of Sally as a block of ice. Yeah, the yeah, the metaphor. You, you, that we can't spell that out. And that's perfect for an answer to you. Who, for, if, oh, I, I thank John for this. Because yeah, I think it's a Merleau-Ponty-like point. I mean, some metaphors we can spell out. The table is supported by that thing the way we're supported by our legs. But John has this Sally is a block of ice, and he goes through a whole article trying to spell out why we feel that that tells us something important about Sally, and she's not literally cold, and she's not literally hard, and so forth and so forth. Anyway, I think Merleau-Ponty thinks that some metaphors can be spelled out, but that we don't do it that way, and that some, I don't, and I bet he thinks, or he should think, some metaphors can't be spelled out, but that's all right, because we don't, we don't implicitly do it that way anyway. Uh, it, it, okay, back to this. <laughs> it's, I can't resist, but I, I'm doing pretty well. Okay, uh, let's see now. I'm at the bottom of 149. Well, I said the actual subjects have these meanings and so forth, and they do not require to be made explicit in order to be exploited. I want to say, and they can't be, and luckily they don't, because, they, because we couldn't. And I haven't found that in him yet. I'm just telling you that. When I move about my house, I know without thinking about it. And I think I want to add now, my, I want to read this. And I'm claiming that he says this, but I haven't found the passage yet to tell you. No, you'll see it someday. When I move about my house, I know without thinking about it. And that means consciously or unconsciously, explicitly or implicitly. That's just not the kind of thing. Know-how is not implicit knowing that. So, so he goes, let's see, where am I again? Uh, I know without thinking about it that walking towards the bathroom means passing near the bathroom. Now he's spelling it out, but he's spelling it out in a way that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg, I believe he thinks. That looking at the window means having the fireplace on my left. In this small world, each gesture, each perception is immediately located in relation to a great number of possible coordinates. Well, all I can say at this point is, if you're in the AI business, for instance, and think you could spell out all that we've got in, the, in, in, the, in this weird way, it was a relation of how, where everything is to everything else, in a kind of, uh, what AI people would call a frame, maybe, for my house. I think that is just crazy, and it's turned out to be impossible for the AI people anyway. But, but the, I haven't claimed I proved it yet. Keep your eyes open. Does he think that this could be spelled out, that it's implicitly comprehensible in mental terms? Wouldn't that make him an intellectualist if he thought that? It sure would. And he's not an intellectualist, he says, so we've got to be, keep your eyes open. Um, so at the bottom, these acquired worlds would confer upon my experience its secondary meaning. I themselves carry carved out of a primary world, which is the basis of the primary meaning. In the same way, there is a world of thoughts. Oh, well, he's just giving you these, these parallels, the, the, the things that Schneider doesn't have now. A world of thoughts or a sediment left by our initial processes which enable us to rely on our concepts and acquire judgments as we might on things that are in front of us. So our thoughts have the same structure as the perceptual things in front of us presented globally without there being any need for us 
to resynthesize them. That's an important line too. Remember that, because everything is always already synthesized. That's the whole greater than the parts. Whenever you hear about synthesizing or resynthesizing, I think he doesn't think that we ever synthesize them. That they they are synthesized all right. That is, if synthesized means they have all these interconnections to each other. There was never a time when they had to be synthesized or resynthesized, which doesn't mean that sometimes you can acquire a new skill, like you using a blind man's cane, in which you will have to do the synthesizing. You will have to get the bumps in the palm of your hand related to the curve. But when you really got this, the cane in hand, then you, nothing is synthesizing anything. I mean, your mind isn't doing it consciously, your mind isn't doing it unconsciously. And before the end of the time, I'm going to try to claim the brain isn't doing it either. It's just not done. <laughs> but, but the only reason you could believe in synthesis is if you made them, the, the, the praises you the moan and believe that there were all these little parts to synthesize in the first place. That's what makes you an intellectualist. If, you're an, if you believe that there are elements, then you believe that somehow they must be synthesized into this gestalt whole then you are going to have a story about the synthesis. It's going to be a concept that enables you to do it or something like that. If you're a gestaltist and think the whole is prior to the parts and the whole is just given, both the perceptual holes, which we're just born with some of them, some of them we learn, cultural holes we pick up by imitation, but we pick them up as a whole. We never have to go through the elements unless it's some weird special thing like the blind man's stick. I think he holds. But, and now let's see, so I don't have to do this. Uh, there we are on 150. Where are 150? Uh, yeah? Yeah? The East Coast, which is knowledge of space relations with things in the past. Well, I said that, but I would say I, I, exactly that you can always, and this is, I think, the illusion of the intellectualist. I'm from, I keep wanting to say, this is what I believe Merleau-Ponty says. Keep your eyes open, you'll find him saying it somewhere. If he doesn't say it, he's an intellectualist, and he knows very well he's not an intellectualist. But on this point, I want to say, what fools intellectualists is, is that you can always sort of do the tip of the iceberg. You can start telling the stuff you know about the house, but you mustn't think that, that, that it's all like that all the way down, implicitly. That's just what you can, on reflection, sort of turn it into, not make it out of it. Uh, in, in AI, you see this in the common sense knowledge problem. You can make a lot of your common sense knowledge explicit. Uh, there are these wonderful examples of, uh, from the one asked that when you're dead, you stay there, dead. Or John Searle, did uh, George Bush wear his underwear? And then, then you're supposed to think not, gee, all my common sense knowledge is like that, but there is so much common sense knowledge we would never be able to get it all spelled out like that. And but I added one, you can't whistle and chew gum at the same time. That's true too, you can spell that out. But try spelling it all out and the answer is going to be, I think, there isn't any such thing as the total common sense knowledge list of all the common sense things you know. And there isn't any list of how you go around your house and the bathroom is related to the living room and the living room related to the kitchen either. And it's an illusion, which is a very interesting illusion that you get, because you can spell out some of it, you assume you must need to say. The two thing forces that make somebody an intellectualist, I think. They, one, the, the thing that Al is saying, you can start spelling out some of it, Merleau-Ponty just did. Uh, and you can spell out some metaphors, as she just did. And that you think then it must be like that all the way down. But why do you think it must be like that all the way down? Because you think it needs to be explained how you get these relations to other things. How you know that this movement will be related to this perception. How do you know that, the, when you, that the living, when the living room is on your right, the kitchen is on your left. And that must be somewhere in your mind. Okay, I'm going to say now what I was going to say at the end. But this is what's really on my mind today. So I might as well say it now. The, the really crunch thing that you're going to ask, and it could have been more dramatic to say it to the end. I wonder if I can do that. Yeah, well, I'll half say it. The, the, the thing you're going to have to keep asking Merleau-Ponty is, how are you finally going to explain all this stuff about horizons and so forth without finally becoming an intellectualist on some level 
and saying it's something that the mind is able to do. Or becoming an intellectualist on another level and saying it's something the brain does, uh, just like a mind, but sort of out of touch with the mind. And I think that you don't, if you, that's what's going to drive you to intellectualism. You're going to think that you need a mental explanation of it. You're going to think you need to find the rules. You think you're going to think you need to be able to do implicitly what you could make explicit, or that it's done unconsciously, or that it's done by the brain. And I'm going to say, no, you don't need any of that. And if you did need that, you would be forced to be an intellectualist, as everybody has been up to Merleau Ponty. Yeah. Is it time for any questions and answers now? What do you think? I was yeah. hoping to go on, but you got all the people have too many questions. So, a criticism of uh, okay, talk you for a while. and Searle yeah. is against this position is really demonstrated in the sense that Searle says that at some level there must be some sort of synthesis going on, some sort of implicit knowledge, because you can knock out parts of the brain and you lose just parts of the perceptual content. So there are parts of the brain you can knock out and you lose actually uh, categories of rooms or categories of buildings. So that's always the, the counter argument to what you're saying that no, at no level, there's no synthesis going on. We can't explain it. Mm, okay. This is what's forcing people we, into intellectualism. That's interesting. I don't, I had never thought of that aspect, that argument before. I'm not impressed. I mean, I think Marilyn Quarantini is going to say that these are artifacts of taking up parts, breakdown parts of the brain and so forth. And if these concepts, say rooms, sort of in isolation, we wouldn't be able to use them to understand rooms. It's only when they're part of this higher order synergistic system. They always have to fit in this hole. So, so, but that would be the right move to make if you were going to make an intellectualist yeah. move to try to say that. that. But I think you really got to believe, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end, I mean, that the brain has a certain kind of top-down holism, and we don't know much about it, that what, uh, what 11 or 12 billion neurons can do, we don't know much about anyway. I think it's related, is it up to 12, I think it's up to 12 billion neurons with 10,000 connections on each, it goes up all the time, and we have no clue what it does. But you can imagine that it, what it does is top down. That's what Walter Freeman has got supposed evidence for. And it doesn't do it by analyzing anything into anything. Uh, it's important to just tell yourself that that could happen. Because as soon as you have the idea that, that the brain could be doing it in a way which has nothing to do with how we do it when we're minds, then that liberates you. I'm getting, I am saying what I was going to say at the end. What you, what, that liberates you to have to take the phenomena at face value. That is, there's, it, it's only if you think that there's got to be an explanation of the gestalt top-down holism, of which there aren't any elements, and elements are only the result of the prejudice of the world, if you think that that can't be the bottom line, there must be an explanation, then you're driven to intellectualism. And you're driven to say, and I was going to say this to the end, Merleau Ponty talks about horizons, he talks about uh, the being in the world, he talks about existence, he talks about maximum grip. That's all very well, Merleau Ponty. You've got the best phenomenology in the world, you could say to him. But you can't explain how that works. And then the intellectualist says, I've got an explanation of how it works. And the associationist says, I've got an explanation of how it works. What is Merleau Ponty supposed to say? He's supposed to say, I don't need an explanation of how it works. The brain does something. Physical stuff come in and the physical brain does something. And then I've got a world. And the world is already holistic. And my body is already synergistic. And they already fit together. And I'm giving you a description of that. And there's no reason why there has to be anything more basic than that description. That's very important to keep in mind. And now, uh, okay, James and then Rick. Well, um, it just seems like if what you're worried about is a reduction, or reduction or something like that, then that's fine. But that's not to say that there's no brain story, that there's no expl explanation at the brain level. It's just that there's a different explanation okay. at the sort of content level. Oh, um, well, yes, but I'm... But the, the, there's no reason why they can't work together. Yes, but the question is how they work together, right. There could be a kind of intellectualist cognitivist brain level working with an intellectualist cognitivist phenomenological level. That would be, if I'm going wrong. You're going to close this? Okay, that would be wrong. Or there could be, and I'm claiming this is what Merleau Ponty thinks there is, a dynamical system story to be told about the brain. 
where the brain is in some holistic way putting all this together and all the component parts are being coordinated with each other within the brain and there are attractors in the brain which are not ever come about, have any rules or elements in them and that is correlated with the phenomena uh, namely that he's describing. So sure there's going to be a brain story. That's what I want to say. If you deny a brain story, that is much too magical for anybody to believe nowadays. But it doesn't have to be a brain story that is correlative with or uh, conceptualism or intellectualism. That, that's, that's what begs the question. Uh, and if there is this holistic brain story, then Merleau-Ponty doesn't owe you any explanation of how the stuff he's describing works. I want to see if you can get the feel for this. The stuff he's describing works because the phenomenal world and the body are the way they are. Now, that there is underlying this a brain doing something and a body doing something, which is correlated with, which, and I probably think, and you can say in Searle's terms, realized, caused by all this stuff that Merleau Ponty is talking about is going to be caused by and realized in the brain. That you don't want to get from that any claim that you need to, that, that there's something merely descriptive about the phenomenology because I just want you to get the feeling. There are, I'll try to put it this way. There are only two levels of explanation that you need, not three. And the intellectualist slips in a third one. That's the cognitivists have always done this. The, the bottom level is the brain does it somehow. We haven't a clue. Or if we do, it's a Walter Freeman-like holistic clue. Uh, and we know that the phenomenon is like this. From that, we have narrow ponte. That there should be underlying this concepts, rules, uh, features, uh, categories, uh, any of that stuff that we use sometimes when we understand things sometimes is unnecessary. There doesn't have to be a third level that it, between the neural level and the phenomenological level that explains the phenomenological level. They're just two different levels of description. They're correlated, but you can't get, you can't get beneath the phenomenological level to another mental level. That's the point. You can get from there to the brain level, which we don't understand. Well, but if you did understand the brain level, it might show that you don't need the mental level. The mental level by which I mean some operations, some, some rules, some noema in visceral language, some categories in current language, which are what's making all hope, putting all this together. It's not to be put together. It's not to be synthesized. Okay, that was the end. But I, but I, I was supposed to let people talk. Yeah. Um, if I ask you to describe the layout of the first house you live in, can you do it? A little. And is that is that because the house or the world is soliciting you? Because you store information about the house? It's because I store information about the house. Which you can retrieve. Which you can retrieve. Well, that's the intellectual delusion. I mean, that, that you can sometimes uh, you know, operate like a representational system is no doubt true. You can, you can have, you can make sentences, you can draw conclusions, you can have memories like the house in which there are elements, I presume, although probably Merrill Punty would say what I've got more like is a field for the house which then I could fit a few rooms in. But whatever. Uh, the fact that you can do mental stuff sometimes can't be an argument for you are always doing that sort of stuff whenever you are an intelligent being. I see. So, so the objection is not to the being coherent about there being mental representation? No. It's that there be an explanatory level of the phenomenological level with which the whole thing is redone in terms of synthesis and mental representations. It's resynthesized in, in this bad way of talking. But I, the, 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 the only trouble is to think that there is something going on beneath the holistic top well, down the, story. The, the sort of standard argument that yeah. the scientists do yeah. is that many of the capacities that you have have themselves an information theoretic structure. That is to say, they're governed by certain patterns of, of, of systematicity. So, for example, you understand the words I'm saying right now. 
presumably your, according to this knowledge, yeah. I don't agree with this. Yeah, I understand. It's a compositional story. Right. So you understand it presumably because you understand the meanings of my words and you understand some of the rules governing the way the words are combined. And of course, then we shouldn't get off too much in this. But and then the, the Merleau-Pontian says, okay, there is a grammar may have some compositional structure. Why not? But uh, uh, it's not at all clear that semantics, that is, meaning does. And it's pretty clear that pragmatics, how language actually functions when people talk to each other, doesn't have that structure. At least phenomenologically, clearly doesn't have that structure. Why should we think that because you know grammar is compositional and has a but the cognitive is, structure, we should think the whole thing does. But the challenge is if you accept that certain aspects of your linguistic skills should be thought about a combination Yes, I about, think that's right. Then why not say the same thing about your ability to walk? Well, I mean, because for one thing, it doesn't seem right. But, on the, but I mean, why not? Because we, we've got arguments for the computation, the compositional story of, of grammar. But and if we had arguments about the, the, that there was a schema uh, underlying my ability to walk, which put together elements into a coherent pattern, we believe it. Uh, but well, we yeah. don't. But you know that there's a finite number of muscles in your body, and there's a finite number of bones, ah. and unless they're skillfully manipulated in, yeah. in very precise ways, given the different forces exerted on them, oh, and yeah. the movements of the surface, yeah. you would fall over. That's why it's hard for an engineer to make something that can walk. That's you right. You can do it. And yeah. You say you can do it, it feels right, you're a solicit. Right. And they say that. But isn't Mother Nature just the other thing she never can do? Yeah. Deploying certain principles to achieve okay. conscious access. Well, Al was saying just what he should say, and, and, and he was the one I was you know, thinking of while I talked. Uh, but the, I want to say, sure, the brain has to take account of this physical thing, which is the body of bones and sinews, and it has to learn how to do it so that it doesn't <coughs> fall over in a gravitational field and all that, and it does it. But why we should think that it does it by rules or by uh, concepts or by anything that, that it, we don't have a clue as to what the brain does when it does it, but we know this much. We don't experience bones having to be in the right relation to tendons, having to be in the right relation to gravitational fields. We experience this holistic, synergistic system. And uh, why suppose that when the brain does it for us, it does it the way we do it when, we are, when we're thinking about things and learning new skills. I mean, that's the crucial question. It's always reading back down into the brain's way of doing it, our way of doing it. And I think Marilyn Ponty is resisting that. Okay, now, Rick, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to tie in what you were saying to Schneider. Yeah, so okay. something that's okay. a natural question to ask, you know, in, in this whole chapter is why even talk about Schneider? Why not just tell us what's normally going on in normal people? And I think what, what, what might be up his sleeve is precisely this kind of philosophical scientific point where we want to get clear on these top-down explanations. And when we look at Schneider, uh, the mistake is not to, not to see the holistic nature of what's going on with Schneider. So some of the he talks about... What Chris was so perfect until then, I mean, terrific. <laughs> it's not, not that we don't see the holistic thing going on with Schneider. We don't see that Heidegger, that Schneider hasn't got the holistic thing going. Ah, on. yeah, well, right, right. Okay. And so we're not, we're not, we're not applying this holistic. Uh, yeah. He has no horizons. He has no significance. He has no uh, synergistic system in his for his body. And you're absolutely right. I think that's a terrific thing to say. When when we do Schneider, we're supposed to see what it would be like for us to be like a computer and do everything like an intellectualist. He's a caricature of intellectualism. Yes, he's a kind of, he's a kind of caricature of cognitivism and intellectualism because he does have to figure out where his body is most of the time. He's not a complete caricature because he can swat a mosquito. But when he's trying to figure out where... That's how he's a caricature of empiricism. Okay, good. Yes, he has a reflex art. Yeah. But, and sometimes he's a caricature of intellectualism when he tries to find out where his hand is in objective space and his head is in objective space and then get his hand in object. That's like the hand-eye robot that was being built for them. IT when I was there. They never managed to make it work. They couldn't have so many degrees of freedom that it needed to go through to find its objective hand and then bring it over in objective space to something else and so forth. And Schneider is like that. Schneider is like a, a kind of uh, cognitive, a, a cognitivism. Yeah. And so it seems like perhaps part of the part of introducing the Gelbin Goldstein Schneider discussion is that the mistake is precisely to think you can build up an understanding of a whole normal person from a distorted 
Schneider, which is just all these messed up. Maybe. Maybe you're going too far. I mean, that, that would be interesting to do, but I think Merleau-Ponty doesn't go that far. Maybe he does. Well, he talks about the being in the world and how Schneider just doesn't have... That's right, but that's a slightly different point. I think the point is to see what it would be like not to have holistic being in the world <laughs> and how that would be like intellectualism. And then we see that we've got something that Schneider hasn't got. He doesn't, I think, try, although it would be interesting to try, to see if you could, how you couldn't, how you could try to build up what we've got out of what Schneider's got and how you couldn't. Well, I think that, that's what Joe Goldstein attempts to do and, and why, they're, why they're so peculiarly uh, wrong. Because it, it's, it's not just... Ah, they're, they're, interesting. They're, they're wrong in a deep methodological scientific way. So that's why good. he has all this discussion about right. scientific good, good. I see what you mean. induction. Mm -hmm. and, and it's this new understanding of science. That's which right. Which relates to the new understanding of our being, this behavioral dimension, which he thinks is supported by Schneider. So he, that's right. so he thinks Schneider is actually scientific support for this new dimension of being, this third... He or Gel Goldstein. Uh, Merleau-Ponty, and so Gelvin Goldstein's mistake is that they don't quite recognize that. No, a lot let me things. try to put it back to you because we're so close to getting something important right, but this doesn't sound right to me yet. I mean, what Gelvin Goldstein think is, and you sort of said this, you should be able to put Schneider together in a way that it was like us, and so you, you just you put more abstract attitude in, and, and, and or abstract movement, and more, more concrete movement, and, more and and you get it all together right. Schneider could be would be like us, but he's lost it. And, and Merleau Ponty wants to say, no, no, you can't put these pieces together to be like us. What Schneider has lost cannot be understood in terms of the pieces. Yeah. Okay, we, we agree about that, and that's right. So, and, uh, and, and Del Goldstein seems to think they've got the true elements, namely that concrete motion and abstract motion out of which you could build a normal person if you put them together in the right way, but somehow in Schneider they've fallen apart. And, and, and this is just my way of trying to get clear on the question, why the heck talk about Schneider in the first place? Okay, and the answer is because when you have, and, and not this, what we just said, that's only part of it. Mostly, it's typical of Merleau-Ponty. You look at the, at the dysfunctional breakdown cases to see something that we got which is absolutely crucial but is so transparent like water to the fish and so ungraspable in intellectualist terms that we wouldn't see it except to see what it looks like when, some, when Schneider hasn't got it. That leads him to talk about what we have got. That's a great line to go back on this because I want to, uh, let me go on a little bit. I, I, I skip a bit about horizons here. But I want to say, get his, his diagnosis of all this. Gestaltus understand that Schneider lacks something, but Merleau-Ponty has a better understanding and a more holistic understanding than they've got. Uh, and they only get as far as our experience has horizons. That the Gestaltists know. Everything we do is done on a background of other things we're not doing. And everything we do can become a figure and then something else will be made. Everything in the background could be made into a figure and then something else will be put in the background. That's not, that's not big enough. Uh, for what, what we need. What we really th want to think is that uh, why does all our experience have horizons? Because we're involved in coping and, uh, and that's called existence. I want to run through all these slogans of my old time that's left the, and, and so you'll see how the argument goes and how it looks like an explanation but it isn't and it isn't supposed to be. So there's this on 140 about a deeper intentionality at the bottom, which we saw already. That's called existence. And that's what uh, Schneider lacks. The bottom of 140. We read, we read it last time. That, that what, there was, it's concrete and abstract movement, but, uh, and then it looks like there's only in itself existence and for itself existence, but then in the footnote there's a deeper intentionality, which others have called existence. That's Heidegger. And that's the third term in, in the next footnote between the psychic and the physiological. And uh, we, we are, we're always led to that. We call it existence. Well, that gets us a little further. We realize that existence is all tied up with the intentional arc, which normal subjects have. Uh,
Well, when he calls at the bottom of 152, sort of badly, a subject-object dialogue, a drawing together by the subject of the meanings that used through the object and so forth, and he's talking about all that and it's lacking in Schneider's case, but when he finally gets down to what he wants to call it, he calls it an intentional arc, remember? Now, where is that? I would miss 150. I got the wrong marking somehow. Oh, here it is. I've got it. It should have been 150. I mean, that's not the first, the only place, but that's the one we want right now. Uh, at the bottom of 150, he says, the world structure with its two stages of sedimentation and spontaneity is at the core of consciousness, but it, and it is in the light of the leveling down of the world that he shall succeed in understanding Schneider's problems. What Schneider leveled down is the intentional art. Um, I guess I've said this in too many different places in too many different ways. Um, on 157. Yeah, that's the main one, which we looked at last time, but it's very, very important. He, what he calls the intentional arc is the way our uh, experience is constantly feeding back into the world, remember, so that it projects around itself, about ten lines down, the life of consciousness, cognitive life, perceptual life, and the, this intentional arc is uh, always there. And uh, but it, and then he says it projects around itself, which is bad. We don't want to say that our past, our future, and so forth and so forth. Or rather, and now he gets it right, it results in our being situated in all these respects. It is the intentional arc. That is, we don't project it around us. We're just in it. It's not a searchlight. Remember, he says that we that we have and we point at things. It's that we are in, always think of the feedback thing. We're in a world which is already full of meaning, always already full of meaning. We never get a meaning from the ground up, which we act in and then we enrich with more and more meaning, and then it shows up. And so, or rather, which results in our being situated in all these respects. And this, it is this intentional arc which brings about the unity of the senses of intelligence, of sensibility, and motility. It's that which goes limp in Schneider. Schneider hasn't got it. Uh, now, the next question is, uh, and the intentional arc is the same as being in the world. That should be obvious. That's being already in the world. Uh, and on 141, he says, uh, it's the middle. Seigen and Greifen are two ways of relating to the object, two types of being in the world. That's, that's, we've seen that a lot. So now, we've seen that it's leveled on 150. Um, <coughs> You know, we've got the leveling down of the world, it goes limp. And now why does it go limp in Schneider? I just want to show you that there are a whole lot of sort of explaining questions that don't really explain anything. Well, it turns out because he lacks the power to sustain it, or the middle of 155. The patient's being, his power of existing, is what his illness is taking away. So existing turns out to be a kind of energy, as he calls it in the Phantom Limb chapter, an energy that you have to open up a world if you're healthy, and this power can go weak if you're ill, and then your world collapses. Um, at the middle of 156, future and past are shrunk in extension of the present. He's lost our power of looking according to the temporal vector. Well, now we've got this magical power thing. That doesn't really explain anything. He just renamed the problem. So, well, what is the, this uh, power? Well, it's a tendency toward basic hoping. I mean, all of these things are just names for the same thing, I think. They're not really explaining anything, but I hope I've tried to convince you that you don't have anything to explain. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, I've done that one. It's called, it's, a, it's something, it's a momentum called existence, he calls it. A momentum, see, he's got these energy, these dynamic terms. It's an energy, it's a power, it's a momentum. Existence is all at about five lines down in 159. Now, here's an important point, I'm still getting here. Insects already have this momentum of existence. Remember, if you tie up one leg, they go struggling on to do things with another leg. What do we have that insects don't have? Well, we have the intentional arc. What's the difference? Insects just have a fixed world. Our world is constantly enriched by what we learn. That's very important. 
in AI, that's the difference between the animats that they've now got at MIT that Rodney Brooks is making, which already could be said to have existence, maybe, but they don't learn. They do, their world doesn't change. And that's, and that's very important. We've got that in the higher animals have it. Okay, then the next question becomes, and why do we have it? Well, it's because, and now you're beginning to sound familiar, although you're not really learning anything new, it's because we have a tendency to get a maximum grip on the world. This is on 177. And so let's look at that. This is a very important paragraph. Uh, uh, it's about 10 lines from the bottom. I'm going to read it fast. Whether a system of motor or perceptual powers, our body is not an object for an I think. It's a group of lived through meanings which moves toward equilibrium. And our natural powers come together in a richer meaning. And then it's skipping a little. So, and, and, and we reshuffle these elements into an equilibrium. Now, why am I making a fuss about that? Because this talk about getting toward a maximum richness, getting more rich, getting equilibrium, all that finally is maximum grip talk. So the whole thing bottoms out if you ask, well, why do, why do we want to cope? Well, we want to cope, finally, in order to get the richest grip, which gives us an equilibrium with the world. And that's the bottom line. Now, now I can say quickly, because I, I said it early, and if you say, but you haven't explained anything there, O'Conti, you've just gone from you know, wider and wider things, from the horizon to existence to being in the world to... Uh, coping with everything to finally trying to get an optimal grip on everything, the biggest thing. What does that explain? Uh, how, do, why, how do we do that? And I think the answer is supposed to be there's nothing we can explain. I mean, something is going on in the brain and we get a world in which we can and do do that. And all we, can, all we phenomenologists can do is describe the world in which we can and do that. What you don't want to do is give an account, that's the intellectualist story, of some mental operations which enable us to do it. Because if you get the right feeling of the holistic bound story, then there couldn't be any mental operations that enable us to do it. And that's, the, that's where we can stop. Okay.